So I want to talk first about trust. Think about institutions that depend and succeed in building trust. For example, many of you know this institution, Lonely Planet. Lonely Planet is the guidebook, guides you around the world in very powerful and, quote, reliable ways. How does it achieve its reputation of reliability? Well, here's what Lonely Planet says. Lonely Planet books provide independent advice. Lonely Planet do not accept advertising and guidebooks, nor do we accept payment in exchange for listing or endorsing any place or business. Lonely Planet writers do not accept discounts or payments in exchange for positive coverage of any sort. So the point is not that money in this context would mean that what they said on Lonely Planet was false. It is instead that money produces mistrust. Or think about another example. Wikipedia. As many of you might know, Wikipedia refuses to accept ads on its pages. As the ninth largest website in the world, that means they leave about $100 million every year on the table in advertising revenue. So I asked Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, exactly why they would be so extraordinarily uh, imprudent with funds that could be used for very good causes. And Jimmy Wales had this to say in response. But we do care about how the general public looks to Wikipedia in all of its glories and all of its flaws, which are numerous, of course. But the one thing they don't say is, well, I don't trust Wikipedia because it's all basically advertising fluff. So once again, the point is not that ads would mean that what was said in Wikipedia was false. It's that ads would breed mistrust. In both of these cases, the problem is not money in a simple sense. The problem is money in the wrong places. That's the conception of trust. Then on the opposite side, there's mistrust. As one dictionary describes it, the act of believing that a particular party has a hidden agenda or ulterior motive. Think about contexts where this mistrust is increasingly a problem. For example, science. In the last 15 years, there's been an explosion in the number of parents who refuse to vaccinate their children against debilitating diseases such as measles. This is the consequence. The consequence of this, of course, then, is the return of these deadly diseases, measles, for example, exploding in the incidents across most of North America and Europe. Doctors tell these parents that these vaccines are safe, but the parents increasingly ignore the doctor's advice. Why is that? Well, as New York Times put it at the beginning of the year, there is a huge trust gap between parents and public health officials right now, a trust gap, meaning when they tell them what is true, the parents don't believe it. And why is there this trust gap? Well, these claims about safety are made in a context of science, and that context has a particular character, a character that is increasingly affected by money. So for example, this advertisement might be something that you would come across in a doctor's magazine. <clears throat> you might choose to reperfuse. You might be confused. Uh, about what exactly reperfusing is, you would be confused like the Oxford English Dictionary is confused. There's no such word <laughs> as reperfuse. But if you do choose to reperfuse, you should be doing it with this drug, Activase. Activase is a drug that deals with what we would call strokes, what the industry likes to call now brain attacks. It was studied in 1998 by the American Health uh, Heart Association. That study concluded generally that the drug should be supported, it was safe and effective, but there was a dissent published in that study. But when the report came out about the drug in 2000, the dissent was erased. Indeed, the name of the dissenting doctor was removed from the list of doctors who had submitted studies on this report. And then an enterprising journalist from the British Medical Journal discovered that Genentech, the drug company that had developed this drug, had given the American Heart Association more than $11 million, raising obvious questions 
as Janine Lenzer put it, this recommendation may have been made in the true spirit of unbiased scientific inquiry, but the appearance of dispassionate analysis was eroded by large donations from a drug company. So this is a context that produces doubts, doubts caused by perceived conflicts. As the House Oversight Committee put it in a study of this, the FDA standards defining conflicts of interest are ridiculously broad. The CDC has virtually no standards because all committee members receive automatically receive annual waivers, meaning they can be receiving money from drug companies whose drugs they are reviewing at the same time that they give their judgment about whether these drugs are safe. In one case, $250,000 received by one of these reviewers. These doubts then feed a deadly meme in this context. Here's that meme. Um, but the science is clear, and what happens is, I read the science at first, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of studies that connect thimerosal to, you know, to these disastrous neurological disorders. Then I went, I talked to the scientists, then I went and I talked to the federal bureaucrats who are defending thimerosal, and I said, what are you relying on? And I looked at the science they're relying on, and I can tell you, Joe, it is so weak, and you and I have seen, you know, in legal practice, when junk science, and we know, you know, what these phony scientists are who create this stuff. big tobacco. Right. Tobacco. It happens in and big this oil. Is, and this it's is, happening in global warming. And, and now it's happening in a way that's impacting is, our kids' lives. This is classic tobacco science. It is classic tobacco science. Now, I think Robert F. Kennedy uh, uh, Jr. is wrong about his views about the relationship between thimerosal and autism. I don't think the science supports that claim. But what he is able to do is to trade upon a meme that is familiar to all of us, classic tobacco science, which translates into corrupted science, corrupted because the scientists are themselves involved in a commercial sense with the outcome of the research, weakening trust in science. Or a more familiar context where this problem exists, politics. I don't know if many of you saw this extraordinary film called Maxed Out. It's the story of credit card debt in the United States. The problem with credit card debt, of course, has many dimensions. One dimension, one important cause of this problem, is something called the Bankruptcy Abuse, and, uh, Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of 2005. It's a little bit of a typo. There's no consumer protection in this act. But nonetheless, <laughs> the consequence of this act, its effect, was to make it effectively impossible for lower middle income, income people to discharge their credit card debts. So whereas companies like Bethlehem Steel can escape pension obligations through bankruptcy or Enron can escape obligations to deliver power to California, you literally cannot escape the credit card obligations you might have in bankruptcy. You will be carrying these obligations forever. Now this idea was first proposed during the presidency of Bill Clinton, and he was originally in favor of it. But then an op-ed published in the New York Times by Elizabeth Warren was read by First Lady Hillary Clinton. And she started referring to, quote, that awful bill. That's a small b in that. <laughs> <laughs> and she is credited by Professor Warren with single-handedly keeping this bill from becoming law, to her great credit, so to speak. But this bill was like Jason in Friday the 13th. It just wouldn't go away. So in 2001, it returned. And by now, First Lady Clinton was Senator Clinton. And by now, she had received more than $140,000 in contributions from financial services companies. So what did she do now? Well, in 2001, she voted for that awful bill twice. She flipped. Now, why, people ask, did she change her position? Senator Clinton said, of course, it was not the money. Here she is in Chicago a year I, and a half ago. I don't think, based on my 35 years of fighting for what I believe in, anybody seriously believes I'm going to be influenced by a lobbyist or a particular interest group. Now 
Now, of course, the bloggers here were not convinced when she said she was not influenced by the money, but I certainly am. I completely believe you don't become Hillary Clinton by caving into special interest in this particular way, and I think you should believe her too. But what about others? This is the point. What about others when they hear $140,000 in the mix? What do they hear in what she says after they hear that $140,000 came to her campaign? Will they trust that she has given the right answer for the right reason? Will they even engage with her in a conversation about why she has done what she has done? Or will they, as I suspect many of you do, simply believe that once they hear about the money, they understand why she changed her view. So the he point here in both of these cases is not that money is evil. The point instead is a simple recognition. How money poisons trust. How money in some places poisons the possibility of trust because we begin to believe that the decisions or actions or will of the particular institution we're talking about is guided by something it should not be guided by. It's not guided by reason, but instead by an improper reason, by an improper dependence, that the institution or the person has lost the independence they need to make these judgments for the reasons we believe they should be making these judgments. Okay, so the lesson so far is the way that these dependencies can weaken trust. You might say in response, so what? The real question is, do they actually change the results of the institutions that are so dependent? For, in the context of science, for example, doctors assert that it's ridiculous to believe that this funding or gifts from drug companies might affect their decisions, in particular the decisions to prescribe certain drugs, even though a substantial body of research now establishes that even pens and coffee mugs change the prescribing behavior of doctors. And in politics too, the politicians say, it's ridiculous that the political contributions would be thought to change the results of any particular politician. Maybe it affects access, as uh, former Congressman Mazzoli from Kentucky put it. People who contribute get the ear of the member and the ear of the staff. They have the access, and access is it. Access is power. But even though they concede this, the politicians insist it doesn't change the results. Well, I find this pretty hard to believe, right? At least if you want to be charitable about what our Congress does, it's pretty hard to believe. Because think about easy cases which Congress faces, which they systematically just get wrong. As was described in the introduction, I've spent a good chunk of my life fighting in the context of copyright law. That battle began about 10 years ago, October 27th, 1998, when Congress passed a statute in honor of this extraordinary man, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term <laughs> Extension Act. The, the Sonny Bono Act extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. And the question Congress was supposed to ask when they were considering whether to pass this bill was whether the extension of the copyright for an existing work advanced the public good. Well, when we took this challenge to this statute to the Supreme Court, we had a brief signed by a number of economists, including five Nobel Prize winners, including this left-wing Oh wait, I'm sorry, that's Milton Friedman, this right-wing <laughs> Nobel Prize winner, who said he would only sign the brief that asserted that there's no possible way that this could have advanced the public good if the word no-brainer existed in the brief somewhere. So clear was it that this could not have advanced the public good, but apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress ratified that statute. Here, an easy public policy question which Congress gets wrong. Or think in the context of nutrition. There's a consensus among those who know something about the matter that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. 2003, the World Health Organization decided they wanted to try to advance progress on the basis of this consensus. So they set out a standard that said no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from sugar. 
Well, the sugar industry, they have this sweet little logo here. They uh, were not happy with this. They went ballistic. There they are, going ballistic. Um, <laughs> they got the United States Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO unless the WHO backed down from this outrageous suggestion that you only consume 10% of your daily caloric intake from sugar. There's Larry Craig writing a letter to the WHO <laughs> making this threat. Instead, they wanted... 25% of your daily caloric intake to come from added sugar. Well, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board promulgated standards that allowed 25% of your daily caloric intake to come from added sugar. This is a balanced diet, according to our government. You can wake up with some Fruit Loops or M&Ms for breakfast, you can have a glass of milk, then you can have a cheeseburger for lunch, then you can have pepperoni pizza, indeed three slices of pepperoni pizza, and then sugar cookies for dessert. This is a balanced diet according to our government. Once again, an easy public policy question, which our government just gets wrong. Or think most profoundly and most importantly, perhaps, about global warming. There's, of course, a consensus among scientists that we are doing it, as Al Gore describes this consensus. The debate is over. There are five points in the consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. Now, some wanted to test whether and how long this consensus has existed. So they did a study of a 1,000 peer-reviewed articles in journals published between 1993 and 2003. And they found that 0%, exactly 0 of those articles, questioned this basic consensus. Then they did an equivalent study in popular media article, uh, journals, two, 600 articles in journals published between 1988 and 2002. They found that 53% of those articles questioned the basic consensus. And that skepticism was a product of the junk science that had been funded by industry to draw into doubt what the scientists were absolutely clear about, leading to the extraordinary, extraordinary delay in our government, maybe of 10 years, before we address this, the most important public policy question we face as a planet. Once again, an easy public policy question which Congress just got wrong, right? These are easy questions. The two plus two equals four questions, which Congress gets wrong. And they do so either because they are idiots or because they are being guided by something other than reason. And I suggest the charitable interpretation is that they are not idiots that in fact they are being guided by something other than reason in this context, a dependency which leads them to answers even when those answers are plainly inconsistent with the clearest public policy recommendations. Those who know something about it would say. Now you might look at this and say, so we've got dependencies that erode trust and dependencies that cor corrupt results. But is there anything new in this? And in fact, the framers of our Constitution were obsessed with this problem of dependence. They thought of it as a problem of independence. And by independence, I don't mean the question of whether we are independent from Britain, but I mean the question that was increasingly their focus in 1785, four years before our Constitution was ratified, when many in America believed that America was going to be a failure and a failure because of a corruption that increasingly had spread throughout governments in the states. Corruption caused by a lack of independence in the representatives who constituted these governments. They were not independent. They were dependents on those whose interests might be advanced directly by such le legislation. As Jefferson described it, this de dependence begets subservience and venality. It suffocates the germ of virtue and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. This is what government had become. And our framers sought a non-dependent, independent form of government that might find the right answer for the right reason. Their common aim was a set of institutions, you could say constitutions against this 
improper dependence. Now, it's not popular to say, but we should confront the fact that they failed in this objective. At least with respect to this institution, they failed. Indeed, their failure begins at the very birth of the republic. The 18th century Hamilton was famous, of course, for devising a plan to pay off the debts of the United States after the revolution. The debts were trading prior to his plan being enacted at about 20 cents on the dollar. Hamilton put together the coalition in the Congress to pass the Debt Repayment Act that would repay the debts at close to a dollar on the dollar. But what he did just prior to getting the debt bill passed was tell representatives where they could go and buy up the debt at 20 cents on the dollar. So they raced across the country buying up as much debt as they could and then they came back and enacted the law that raised the value of the debt from 20 cents to about 97 cents on the dollar. When Jefferson saw this, he was outraged. He went to uh, Washington and he pleaded with Washington that there be a rule adopted in Congress that you not be permitted to vote on any matter which you have a personal interest in. And Washington and Hamilton and most more pragmatic politicians of the time laughed at Jefferson at his idealism and the conception that government could function without such an interest at its core. The 19th century was no better. It's a cesspool of corruption. Here's Daniel Webster, who was, of course, a famous member of the House of Representatives. And at the time he was a member of the House, the House was voting on whether to continue the Bank of the United States. Daniel Webster was employed by the Bank of the United States. Here's a letter he wrote to the bank. If it be wished that my relation to the bank be continued, it may be well to send me the usual retainers. Bribery was not even a crime in Congress until 1853. Now, when you look at this history, you might say, well, you know, today is much the same, right? We have people like Jack Abramoff or Randy Duke Cunningham with his extraordinary schedule of payoffs and government benefits he would deliver. We have Ted series of Tube Stevens convicted, of course, of um, ethics violations. And in your own state, we have, of course, <laughs> the sale of a... Uh, Senate seed, you might look at these stories and say, it's the same as it ever was. But I don't think it is. I join people like Dennis Thompson in believing that in fact our government is constituted today with people of the highest integrity in the history of our government. More, most informed observers, Thompson writes, believe that the legislator's integrity is greater than in the past. I don't believe the problem is a bunch of people going to Washington trying to feather their own nest, even though there are those who do that. I think the dependency we have here is a dependency of a different kind. It is a dependency on money, but it's money to secure tenure. Not tenure at a fantastic place like that, but tenure here. It's the constant attention to money for the purpose of their own re-election or the re-election of other members in their party. Some estimates range between 30 and 70% of a representative's time is devoted to the task of raising money to get re-elected. Their second job, getting money to get re-elected, becomes their first job, and they develop this extraordinary sixth sense, a constant awareness not about how their decisions will affect the judgment of the voters in their district, but a constant awareness about how their actions will affect their ability to continue to raise money from the people who make sure that they get back into office. So this is not a problem about the corruption of the 19th or 18th century. In some ways it's better, and in some ways it's much worse. It's better because the souls of the members of these congresses are better. These are better people. They have ideals. They are good people. But the harm that their particular form of corruption produces, it's much greater. The cost from the bending of special interests that we've seen in just the last eight years is infinitely greater than the cost from the petty corruption that we saw in the 18th and 19th century. The cost of this dependency. Now, I think we need to allow our imaginations to grow a bit when we focus it as a dependency, right? Let's think about 
dependencies we know something about. And we focus in a dependency on both the addicts, those dependent, and the pushers in this process. Right? And the pushers in this story, as told in this fantastic book by Robert Kaiser, the pushers are the lobbyists who have built, in just the last 15 years, an extraordinary economy of influence in Washington. And they have changed the way Washington works. Indeed, since President Clinton left office, the number of lobbyists in Washington have doubled. And the price per hour of lobbyists has doubled as well. Now, if you've got a supply going up and a price going up, that can only be because the productivity of the input is going up dramatically as well. And indeed, the productivity of these lobbyists is going up very powerfully because they have built a system of influence that allows them to deliver on the promises, direct or indirect, that they can make to their clients. Because this place has become, as one congressman put it, a, quote, farm league for K Street. Everyone inside our government, members, bureaucrats, and staffers, increasingly depend upon a business model that's familiar to my law students when they graduate from law school, a business model of being paid a relatively small amount of money for a short period of time, and then cashing into a system of very high payment for a much longer period of time. And that's exactly what everyone in Washington thinks about as they think about the system of influence that these lobbyists have produced. This system which will allow them to retire from Congress after six or eight years and make 500 to a million dollars a year, a system that allows staffers to do exactly the same thing. Everyone has an interest in this system surviving because the business model of DC is one where no one now, either on the right or on the left, has any interest in stopping the influence to develop in exactly the way it has. Now the costs of this distortion, this corruption, are different depending on your political perspective. So if you're from the right, this is a story that would evince the cost that you should be concerned about. Here's the Communications Act of 1934. It has six titles. Title II deals with telecom, telephones. Title VI deals with cable. When Al Gore was vice president, he had the idea to take the internet-related components of Title II and Title VI and put them under Title VII, and to basically make Title VII a deregulated title minimal interconnect requirements, and nothing more. His staff took this idea to Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill said, hell no. How are we going to raise money from the telecoms if we deregulate them? Now, simple people have a simple way of understanding what's being described here. It is extortion. Because what we see is members who are designing regulation in part for the purpose of making sure there is someone they can call on to raise money when they want to get back into Congress. And the question for people on the right is, how much extortion enabling regulation is there out there? As people on the right desire a smaller government or a simpler tax code, exactly what are you fighting against? Is it just an ideology about the size of government? Or is it vested interest whose interest is to keep government as big as it can so that there are as many levers out there as possible to pull when money to run for re-election is necessary? People on the left see a different thing to be concerned about. The most familiar example we know right now is the financial disasters, which we still are suffering in the middle of. They begin, if you think, really in the context of Enron. They continue to the Fannie and Freddie collapse and then the collapse that we've seen on Wall Street. People on the left say, what is the common thread that links all of these disasters together? Well, poor regulatory oversight. And why might there be poor regulatory oversight? Well, because of a campaign of deregulation. And why was there this campaign of deregulation? Follow the money, people on the left would say. So Enron, in the first six months of the Bush administration, Enron spent two and a half million dollars to lobby the administration against regulations that might have led us to see exactly 
the corruption that that company had become. Fannie and Freddie in the first six months last year spent $900,000 lobbying Congress against the regulations that might have led us into a position where we understood the problem they were in. In the first six months of 2006, the hedge, fund, uh, hedge funds raised $1.3 million to lobby, especially Senator Schumer, against the idea of any additional regulation inside the financial services industry that might have led us to understand exactly the problems they were facing. In all of these cases, people on the left say, money has bought the immunity from the regulation that is precisely the regulation that at least at this core industry we need in an economy of the size of ours. But I think the point that people on the left and the right miss is that the problem here is not big government, the problem here is not the problem of deregulation. The real cost here is the cost to trust. It is the mistrust that the system, this dependency produces, at least the mistrust in this institution. In my district, 88% of people believe that money buys results in Congress. And last July, Rasmussen published this extraordinary statistic for the first time in American history Less than 10%, 9% of Americans believe that Congress was doing a good or excellent job. The lowest point in the history of our country, indeed probably more people supported the British crown at the revolution than support <laughs> Congress today. And you look at this and can say, what the hell do you expect? We can't trust the institution. We won't trust the institution. We won't have faith in the institution until we can believe, as all of us want to believe, that they got wrong whatever they got wrong, either because there are more Republicans than Democrats or more Democrats than Republicans, but not because of the money. Now, most of my work in the last decade has been around the problem of IP which is actually two problems, the problem of internet protocol regulation and the problem of copyright, intellectual property regulation. I've written five books in this area and worked in extraordinary projects like the Creative Commons projects, all driving against a kind of IP extremism. But despite enormous success in the public community and getting more and more people involved in this movement, consistently we faced exactly the same struggles in Washington to get them to think about these issues in a more rational way. And so a year and a half ago, I gave up that work, said I was throwing away all of my intellectual capital of a decade and beginning anew on this project against corruption. Because what I recognized is that the destructive, debilitating dependency that made IP policy so bad was exactly the same destructive, debilitating dependency that was increasingly making policy everywhere so bad. That it wasn't just esoteric questions like copyright term, it was fundamental questions like how do we deal with the problem of global warming? And my commitment was to do something about this to understand this dependency and to work to change it. Now, how would you change it? It seems to me the key in any institution that suffers this weakness is to find a way to restore this trust. And the only way in any of these institutions to restore the trust is to remove the dependency that corrodes our trust in that institution. In this sense, we need not so much a declaration of independence, but a declaration for independence, a declaration for the idea that these institutions of public trust need to be constructed in ways that we can sustain our faith in their work, a resolve to remake the economy of influence across this range of institutions, and in particular, to break the link that we believe exists between money and results in at least our government, to restore this trust in our government. Now, one way to do that, and I increasingly believe the only way to do that with Congress, is to embrace an idea which a Republican first proposed 102 years ago, 
Teddy Roosevelt's idea for something we could call citizens funding of the nation's elections, or in a Barack Obama font, it would look like that. Um, <laughs> the idea here is to say that members of Congress raise the money they need to get to Congress is on, in only two ways. Either they get their money in the way that Obama succeeded so dramatically, from citizens directly capped at something like $250 a citizen. Or they get their money from citizens indirectly through money from the Treasury, which is given once a credible campaign establishes itself. Now, my view is that only this kind of citizen-funded election would break the link that we, ex we believe exists between money and the laws Congress passes. Only this particular structure would make it so that no one could rationally believe that when Congress did something idiotic, it was because of the money. Now, motivated by this idea, an organization that I started about a year ago with Joe Trippi, Change Congress, still in its beta mode, decided we would launch an effort to try to build public support for this particular way to break a dependency. And that effort is uh, essentially a strike. We learned a lesson from the internet. The lesson from the internet is everybody will do, and it's easy to get them to do, what they already want to do. So no one wants to be giving money to politicians in general. Barack, the one exception. But in general, they don't want to be giving money to politicians. So we launched a strike that said, no money to politicians until they commit irrevocably to supporting citizen-funded national elections. So no money until they commit themselves to a policy that would break this dependency. Now, when we first thought about this, I thought it'd be great to kind of borrow Nancy Reagan's logo, just, uh, just say no here, uh, but then I discovered it was trademark, so we <laughs> couldn't use that logo. So instead, we had to focus on this strike for change, to build support for a community that says we won't support this system until the commitment is to change this system. So if you go to our site, you'll see this ability to sign up. You put in your information, and we gather from records exactly how much you have given in the last cycle. And we begin to count that against representatives. So we can say, in a particular district, because you're not a supporter of this citizen-funded election, you've lost, now number one, Diane Feinstein has lost the most, a certain amount of money that otherwise would be available to you. And most importantly, it gives you the ability to write emails like this, Hank Berry, big fundraiser for Democratic politicians, wrote me and asked if I would support Senator Leahy. And I could say, thanks, Hank, but I'm on strike. You should be as well. And that's the message I would assert here for you. We all should be as well, insisting that this system change that the system that leaves us not to have any faith in this government change, and not just the system that leaves us to have no faith in government, but the increasing spread of that lack of faith in institutions critical to public life in many different contexts. So I would leave you with the idea first that you join us here, but recognize the same point that exists with our government in many other public institutions as well. Recognize the effect that these improper dependencies have on those institutions and ask the question whether their public regarding purpose can survive unless that effect is changed. One more thought. So I'll confess I'm a little bit of a gore a file. Um, it's kind of my hero. <laughs> This is Al Gore at TED a year ago. Optimism is sometimes characterized as a belief, an intellectual posture. But as Mahatma Gandhi famously has said, you must become the change you wish to see in the world. And the outcome about which we wish to be optimistic is not going to be created by the belief alone, except to the extent that the belief brings about new behavior. But the word behavior is also, I think, sometimes misunderstood in this context. I'm a 
big advocate of changing the light bulbs and buying hybrids and Tipper and I have put 33 solar panels on our house and dug the geothermal wells and done all of that uh, other stuff. But uh, as important it is, as it is to change the light bulbs, it's more important to change the laws. And when we change our behavior in our, in our daily lives, we sometimes leave out the citizenship part and the democracy part. In order to be optimistic about this, we have to become incredibly active as citizens in our democracy. In order to solve the climate crisis, we have to solve the democracy crisis. The democracy crisis. Now, the democracy crisis that we face is not the problem that we can't count votes. Of course, we can't count votes, but that's <laughs> not the crisis. The democracy crisis is that we've lost the sense of democracy as a tool to solve public problems. We instead turn to Starbucks to deal with problems of the environment rather than turning to our own government. And that, I believe, is because we have lost this essential trust. We have this deep mistrust in what this government does because, I suggest, of our recognition of this dependency. Now again, let your imagination run with the idea of this dependency. Because I think a problem of dependency is a problem that we all get, this problem of dependency. Think about dependencies in your own life that may have harmed you. There isn't one of you, for example, that hasn't been affected by the dependency of alcoholism. I know my own family has been destroyed by the problems of alcoholism. So think about the problem an alcoholic faces. He might be losing his family, his job, his liver. These are extraordinarily important problems, indeed the most important problems he could be facing, but what we all recognize is he will not solve any of these problems until he solves his alcoholism first. So it's not that the alcoholism is the most important problem, it isn't. It is just the first problem. And so too is it with us and this democracy. There is no end to the problems that we face, extraordinarily significant problems, from global warming all the way down to rational copyright policy. But we won't address these problems sensibly until we solve this first problem first. Now you, we, have an ethical obligation to do something about this problem. Indeed, we in particular, because if it's not us, comfortable, well-educated, members of a cultural elite in some sense, if it's not us, then who will it be? Because the most outrageous part of this story is that the corruptions I've described here are corruptions primed by the most privileged in our society, and they are permitted by the passivity of the most privileged in our society. We, each of us, can afford to do something about this, the most important first problem we face. And we have that responsibility to do something. You do as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>